Well, hi, everyone. I hope you're having a great conference so far and enjoying the sessions. My name is Andy Pressman, and I am NCAT's Northeast Regional Director located in New Hampshire, where it is a gorgeous day today and the sugar houses are in full swing. And just a few housekeeping items before we get started with Dan. Uh, just to let you know, first of all, this session is being recorded and will be available on your Whova app for the next six months. In addition, we will be using the chat function, which I see is uh, already getting quite the bit of attention. Uh, but for any questions you may have, please feel free to use the chat window. We'll be monitoring that and we'll save a few minutes at the end of Dan's talk for some Q&A. And for those questions we don't get to, we'll be sure to follow up in the next several days. For those of you who are looking to get CEU credits, there will be a QR code on the screen with the last three minutes of the talk today. And so you can take a picture of that and submit for your credits as well. And finally, uh, please make sure to visit your Whova homepage. On the left-hand side is a tab for surveys. And this is where you can go in and evaluate each of the sessions you are attending for this conference, which would be very helpful for the conference organizers. And on that note, I am pleased to introduce my friend, Dan Kittredge, to present this session on soil health innovations for the market farmer. Dan grew up on Many Hands Organic Farm in central Massachusetts. And after a global career in food and seed activism, where he worked with farmers across India, Russia, and South America, Dan returned to the US in 2010 to continue farming and to launch the Bionutrient Food Association, BFA. BFA is a nonprofit educational organization whose mission is to increase quality in the food supply. Dan has become one of the leading proponents of nutrient density and works to demonstrate the connections between soil health, plant health, carbon sequestration, crop nutritional value, flavor, and human health. Be sure to check out the BFA website for lots of great information on soil health and nutrient density, and also to sign up for their 10th annual Soil and Nutrition Conference, which is happening now through September, every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern. On that note, Dan, welcome, and uh, looking forward to hearing your talk today. Well, thank you very much, Andy. That was uh, <laughs> quite an introduction. Um, yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> you know, as Andy said, I grew up on an uh, organic farm, a market farm, and have been, um, you know, farming all my life, basically. And uh, it was when I got married and decided to settle down and try to um, do it as a living, not just because I had to for my parents, um, that I realized that even though I had 20 years of experience um, as a sort of a small organic farmer, when I tried to make a living doing it, it was... Um, very difficult, which I'm sure many people are familiar with. Um, I identified that, uh, you know, just because organic was um, not using toxic materials and things like that um, was, you know, certainly a good thing. But if uh, the levels of pest and disease pressure that I was experiencing and limited yields, et cetera, you know, oftentimes caused by those two things um, was really less than optimal and causal in, in a you know, a lack of a lack of flourishing. And so um, started researching, uh, attending conferences, reading books, I found a lot of value in the Acres USA community, um, a lot of sort of biological principles, um, which are now being integrated into organic and regenerative and things like that. Um, I first I first learned there in the mid 2000, 2005, 2006 uh, timeframe, uh, brought those things home started practicing them and found in very short order that, um, you know, still being able to maintain an organic certification, um, not really changing that much as far as practice, um, but really um, understanding better um, what I was doing and why uh, allowed it, you know, a shift where in fairly short order, pests disappeared, diseases disappeared, yields went up, cost of production went down, shelf life, et cetera, um, flavor improved, and um, you know, it was it didn't take too long to to really be able to make a good living as a market farmer. Um, and I would say even you know not working forty hours a week. Um, so it's those basic principles I want to convey here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, I, I teach a course called Principles of Biological Systems. Um, I do sort of a, a general hour and a half overview, which I'll be giving a, a, a quick summation of here today. Um, but it starts with the um, idea that you know plants are green just about all of them uh, they cover their bodies in greenness uh, to make sugar which they then actually inject out of their bodies um, to feed microbes both on the leaf surface and the um, you know root surface rhizosphere and 
it's really it doesn't matter what kind of crop we're growing, whether it's carrots or kale or, or corn or apples or you know hay. Um, the same principles apply here that in nature, um, plants evolved to get their needs met through symbiotic relationships with microbes. They did not evolve to get their needs met through fertilizer, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, the workshop is titled Innovations for Market Gardeners, but I would say, um, you know, from a foundational perspective, what is old may be new again. So really, you know, if not spending too much time on the broad strokes, but um, the principle here is managing the soil in such a way that the um, microbial communities are able to flourish is foundational in my understanding and experience in being a successful farmer, um, regardless of your scale. Uh, it, your, your cost of production goes down, your plant health goes up, your crop quality goes up, and you know, really we begin to see uh, farming becoming a, a viable you know, lifestyle and occupation um, with good quality of life, uh, which I think many people are aspiring to. So um, again, the microbes are the bottom of the food chain and it's about managing for them. Um, I like to say there's about five key areas we need to be attending to um, that the microbes need to function. They need air to breathe. They need water to drink. They need food to eat. They need some basic minerals to build their bodies out of and they themselves must be there. And all those things um, ideally are present 24 seven, 12 months of the year. Um, it's not okay to feed the microbes between April and October and then leave them unfed between November and, and March uh, because they're still there in the soil and they will you know, basically run out of food and die, um, for an example. So um, you know, how do we manage for these things, uh, air, water, food, minerals, and uh, microbi microbiology? Probably the easiest, simplest, quickest, cheapest, best bang for your buck piece of the puzzle, I would say, is inoculation. Um, ensuring that actually we do have the full spectrum of microbial community, or at least a, a good broad spectrum of microbial community um, in place on the seed when it germinates uh, is really foundational. People may be familiar with the concept of colostrum, whether it's for cows or, or human children. We understand that when we're born, you know, there's no microbes in our alimentary canal. We don't have that um, gut flora established. And it's a critical piece of the life cycle to establish gut flora at birth. As it is for animals, it is also for plants. So oftentimes market gardeners are buying their seeds. Um, um, they're not necessarily organic. In many cases, they don't have a good microbial um, community on the seed. In many cases, the seeds are um, treated in a way after harvest that actually um, is detrimental to that microbial community. So. Um, and then oftentimes when people are starting their seeds, they're not starting their seeds in the ground where hopefully the microbes are doing well, but they're starting it in a potting soil, which may or may not have a broad spectrum of microbes in it. So think about it as, you know, giving your calf, making sure your calf gets colostrum after it's born, or, you know, your baby gets colostrum after it's born. Uh, we want it for our, our seeds as well. Um, it's very simple. I actually have a few bottles of inoculant back here. Um, they're, you know, one ounce of inoculant, um, which might contain, you know, I don't know how many billion spores of ideally a couple dozen different families of bacteria and fungi um, is good for 50 pounds of seed. So, and may, it might cost $5. Uh, you literally open the seed packet, put a pinch in, close the seed packet, shake it up. And then when you plant um, those microbes are, the spores are present, they will, uh, you know, in the presence of moisture and um, uh, warmth, as the seed germinates, they will also germinate and they'll set up that symbiotic uh, relationship. So uh, very, very simple. Um, I see a question here from um, Elena. Um, I personally, uh, there's a few companies out there that I, I, you know, I think do a good job. Um, I personally use the BioCode Gold from um, Advancing EcoAg. Um, but yeah, you wanna be looking for a broad spectrum of, of species in your uh, in your mix, uh, both ideally bacterial and fungal. So that's probably um, the most important, uh, simple, easy thing you can do. Other things are, are more systemic, more expensive, but that is, again, very simple and inexpensive. Um, so uh, we can go to aeration. 
uh, here in, in New England, uh, we're, I think we're hitting 50 today for the first time in a number of months and the, um, you know, snow is starting to melt. Maybe by the end of the week, it'll actually, we'll be actually able to see, uh, see the ground or <laughs> see the sod. Um, if you go out and look out into your field, I've had this experience this time of year many times, um, checking to see the garlic uh, when it comes up. And um, oftentimes when you miss, when you, um, when you plant garlic in the fall, you mulch it. And in some cases, you know, where the garlic patch is, you know, adjacent to that was, you know, carrots pulled in the fall or something else and it was left bare. Um, so when the, when the snow melts and you go out and check this, check the garlic, um, ground thaws, obviously, um, and you reach down, there'll be a nice, um, you know, pile of layer of worm castings and you can reach your hand down into the soil and pick up a handful of it and smell it. Um, and directly adjacent where the soil was bare over the winter, um, it'll be hard and cracked oftentimes in April. Um, it's, you know, it's a fire sign month and we don't oftentimes get a lot of rain in April. Uh, but you'll see that, you know, two soils directly adjacent to each other, one had mulch on it, one didn't. One is loose and aromatic and the other one is actually more like dirt. So, um, you know, keeping the soils aerated um, really is a function of maintaining life in the soil and maintaining life in the soil is a function of, in my, among other things, keeping the soil life fed. Um, so I like to say, you know, um, I'd like to see my soil um, no more than, you know, uh, two weeks out of the 52 months of the, uh, 52 weeks of the year. Uh, at some points, perhaps when I'm transferring from one crop to another, uh, et cetera, there may be a few days of bare soil. But in general, I'd like to see my soil covered as much as possible. And that would count even now, if you've got snow on the ground, if the snow melts, is it bare or not? Um, cover crops are obviously um, being brought forth as an extraordinarily powerful technique. Um, you can oftentimes plant your cover crops maybe in the end of August or September, depending on your climate zone, um, as an understory underneath your tomatoes or your peppers or your eggplants, um, your kale, your chard. There's no reason to wait until the end of the year when the crops are done to put the cover crops in, unless of course you've got black plastic, which would be making it difficult. But ideally you wanna have a gentle transition from your annual crop, which is your money maker, um, to a cover crop system or maintain soil cover through the fall, through the winter. Um, if you can get those cover crops in a little bit earlier, they'll establish and grow taller and be functionally much more beneficial for the microbes. So whether it's mulch or, or cover crops, really think about um, maintaining cover on your soil um, as much as absolutely possible. That will keep the soil fed, that will keep it aerated. Um, there's a lot of talk about tillage these days and minimal till or no till or zone till. Um, in many cases, we really need to be tilling our soils because they're tight and they're tight because they're dirt and they're dirt because they were kept bare for some period of time um, that caused that underlying imbalance to occur. So um, keeping the soil fed really, I think to a large degree is foundational in keeping it aerated. Um, so those are, we got two, uh, two, two for one there. Um, we got the microbes, we've got the feeding, and we've got the uh, aeration. Now, hydration is another key piece of this puzzle. Um, I grew up on a on a farm that was relatively, you know, lowland, um, you know, swampy at certain times of the year. But if it doesn't rain for for four weeks or six weeks, um, if you are unable to maintain hydration um, in the soil, that really does uh, a, a a real number on on the microbes. Think about a chicken or a cow and what would happen if they weren't watered for a week um, or even a cat or dog. Um, when you're, uh, and it doesn't rain and you don't have infrastructure for maintaining hydration, uh, it doesn't take long after that soil dries out for real system collapse to occur. Um, and I always like to mention as well that, you know, when I'm walking through a field, I don't want to just look under the stem at the drip tape perhaps that you have under the stem of the tomato. I wanna to look out 12 inches or out 18 inches. I want the entire soil profile to maintain moisture. Um, you may be able to keep the plant watered, but if you don't keep the soil moist, then anywhere where the microbes are, you know, unable to access water, they'll shut down and it's them that the plants evolve to be fed by. And so if you're keeping the plant watered, but you're not keeping the soil moist, um, you really have a situation where the plant is unable to get fed as it has evolved to. And in many cases, if you think about 
again, a, maybe a human or an animal metaphor. Um, you know, we know about women when they're pregnant, uh, if they don't get enough calcium in their bones, they will, you know, their, their body is, is, you know, has prioritized taking the calcium out of their bones and putting it into their, into their baby. Um, tomato plants do exactly the same thing. Peppers, eggplants, squash, they all do it. Um, when you have insufficient moisture and the soil life shuts down and the plant's not being fed by soil life, um, it will begin to senesce. It'll begin to use up its bottom leaves. They'll turn purple, they'll turn brown, they'll die, they'll die off. It's basically sucking out the parts of its body it doesn't absolutely need so it can make fruit. Um, it's really quite powerful, um, the implications of maintaining hydration. Um, so whether it's overhead or whether it's drip tape, um, whether it's good soil structure at a high water table, which can be maintained with strategic, you know, ponds and and you know, uh, working with the lay of the land, depending on where you are. I don't really care what the um, strategy is. Uh, just want to emphasize that if moisture um, is not present, uh, that is a foundational issue from the microbiological perspective. We're not just worrying about watering the plants, but we're hoping to maintain moisture across the entire soil profile. Again, that is much more easy to do when um, the soil is covered. Uh, people may be, you know, it's aware when it's, you know, a hot summer day and the, and the wind's blowing, bare soil will wick out, you know, it'll basically transpire water out very rapidly. But if you've got a, a layer of mulch, um, you know, inch or two thick or four inches thick, um, really it's feeding the soil life, it's main, it helps maintain moisture. Um, I like to say, look into nature, into nature and see where um, she leaves herself bare. Where do you see bare soil in nature? You know, it's really only where uh, life is not flourishing, um, which may or may not be called nature, a, you know, a human caused desert or things like that. But um, where nature is flourishing, where you have fecundity and vitality, you do not see bare soil. So um, this is just a foundational piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, you look at all kinds of pictures and videos and courses and things like that, and you see straight lines of monoculture plants and bare soil. Um, that's not a sophisticated um, ecosystem. That is a reductionist, you know, <clears throat> factory floor. And you're not going to get good function of life in that environment. So the more you can um, sort of mimic nature, keep soil covered, keep soil moist, maybe even let some of those things that you might be calling weeds uh, grow there. Things like a, a dock or a dandelion or a clover that may be actually a bioaccumulator plant. You know, some of those, take a dandelion, for example, you know, that deep tap root is basically there as nature's cover crop to crack open subsoil and it's actually a bioaccumulator of calcium. So um, we have this concept that we have to have pretty quote unquote bare soil, straight lines, monoculture environments. Um, nature doesn't do that. She doesn't do monoculture, she does polycultures. And and sometimes you can, you know, there's under sowing as well, put your clover underneath your broccoli. There's all kinds of techniques there, but looking more for soil cover for polycultures as much as possible to be integrated into the annual production system um, um, really I think has much beneficial effect. So there we've covered um, hydration on some key points, uh, aeration, uh, feeding. It's during the summertime when plants are growing, the green leaves are making sugar and feeding the soil. I talked about that when there's, you know, when it's too cold out, when the ground's frozen, it's the dead plant material, which is actually keeping the soil life fed. So you want to be always having sufficient levels of those things. Um, I will oftentimes, when I put my tomatoes in or kale or whatever I'm transplanting in, um, I'll mulch it immediately after after planting. So from bed prep to planting to, to mulching, um, we really don't have much time at all when the soil is bare. Um, and that does really beneficially affect uh, the overall system. The final, the final piece I wanted to talk about was um, uh, minerals. This is a piece that I think um, has been um, probably not emphasized as much as it should. Um, we understand that um, biological systems have these things. We'll just use the example of enzymes. Enzymes are used to take amino acids and build them into proteins to um, take carbohydrates and build them into sugars to, I mean, any and all, process of, of metabolism, of growth, et cetera, requires these enzymes. They're basically sockets and wrenches that put things together, take things apart, if you can think of them that way. 
Um, and there's a couple dozen different elements, copper, zinc, you know, uh, cobalt, molybdenum, selenium, chromium, vanadium, yttrium, that are at the core of these enzymes and necessary for life to function. And in many cases, our fertility programs are focusing on, you know, NPK, maybe calcium or sulfur uh, for pH uh, buffering, maybe, you know, three, four or five elements, um, which we think are necessary to grow a plant, like the volume of a plant, um, but they're not sufficient for growing a vibrant and vital and healthy plant. Um, some of those plant defense uh, hormones, compounds we call antioxidants or polyphenols, things like that, uh, terpenoids, alkaloids, those things that correlate with flavor, um, that correlate with pest and disease resistance, uh, that correlate with nutritional value are only built uh, through some of these more sophisticated enzyme systems. And so we have an agriculture which has been focused on volume, not on quality. Um, and uh, as I understand it, you know, a, a broad spectrum of, of different elements is necessary for a biological system to flourish. And so I do recommend um, uh, mineral balancing, um, you know, the Albrecht technique uh, developed by Dr. William Albrecht at the University of Missouri in the, in the 30s and the 40s um, has a lot to offer. Um, and, you know, ideally we have uh, a well-established plant um, ecosystem where we're able to pull things up from the subsoil. Um, but if you don't, you really, your top six inches or, or thereabouts, the, the aerobic zone, uh, the root zone is where the plant needs to be getting everything from. So if you don't have good polycultures established, um, in many cases, you don't have that sufficient spectrum of elements in that, in that top zone. So, um, you know, a, a, a classic um, agronomy soil test, plus ideally perhaps a deep soil core going down two or three feet into the subsoil to see what is in the top, you know, a few inches and then what may have leached down. Um, here in New England, uh, even though we had glaciation, you know, only 10,000 years ago, um, we do get 30, 40, 50 inches of rain a year, depending on the year. And over 10,000 years and a bunch of fairly extractive agriculture for the past, you know, 300 years, uh, a lot of the critical elements have leached out of the topsoil and they're down in the subsoil or, or, or no longer present. So um, cobalt, molybdenum, um, sulfur, copper, zinc, manganese, there's a few of these elements that are fairly typical uh, people maybe, maybe have heard of and addressing them I think is, is quite important. Um, you can either do that directly through copper sulfate and zinc sulfate, boric acid, you know, things like that, or you can do it through uh, more broad spectrum amendments. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, rock dust and sea salt. I think, um, you know, from a systemic standpoint, we should be able to cycle all of our fertility on our farm. We shouldn't need to be bringing things in from off, uh, off farm, um, you know, besides perhaps some cover crop seed and, and, and inoculants uh, after an initial remineralization. So perhaps initially we do need to be bringing things onto our properties to help address those underlying deficiencies. If you look at some areas of the, of the country and the world, sort of more of the equatorial zone where um, we haven't had glaciation for millennia, um, you know, some of those soils are very, very weak in their, in their mineral spectrum. And so addressing them systemically through a material like uh, rock dust, basalts, um, generally the volcanic materials, uh, rocks have a, a better spectrum of elements in them. Um, and, you know, we have basically all the continents are made up of rock and there's wherever you've got roads, you've got quarries, wherever you've got quarries, you've got a waste product called the crusher dust or the, or the float. Um, which can oftentimes be accessed for $2 a ton or $5 a ton, very, very inexpensive. Um, so a systemic remineralization from um, ideally natural uh, local sources, um, you know, I would recommend uh, as, I mean, sea minerals as well, um, you know, what is it? 65% of the planet is covered by ocean. Um, you know, I recommend generally something in the order of 75 pounds per acre of sea salt um, as a prophylactic uh, broad spectrum mineral amendment. Uh, sea minerals, sea salt does have 92 different elements in it, a full, a full spectrum of elements necessary for the um, core, you know, enzyme systems to function. So between, between your rock dust and your sea salt, that's the sort of the, the low tech um, natural material strategy, or you can go the, um, 
the, the copper sulfate, zinc sulfate, um, gypsum, elemental sulfur, boric acid, those kinds of materials, which are, are marketed and have um, generally higher levels of this of targeted targeted elements. So um, broadly, those are the five things that I like to uh, guide people to attend to themselves to uh, when it comes to sort of working with nature. Um, it's really about creating a dynamic where the bottom of the food chain, the microbial um, community has access to everything it needs at all points in time to maintain a high level of function. Um, and minerals, those um, microbes, the broad spectrum of species, they themselves, uh, air, water, and food. I really do find in a lot of operations, um, if you can identify which are the limiting factors on your farm and begin to address them systemically, um, you know, overall system function does radically improve um, if you can ensure that those things are present at all points in time. Uh, there's many more layers of nuance. We can talk about seed size and, you know, epigenetics and, um, you know, the, the you know, time of transplant and soil temperature. There's a bunch of other subtleties which are also quite um, exciting that we may not have enough time to get into today, but I wanted to make sure I covered those, those five pieces um, uh, for sure. So, Andy, that's those are my core points. Anything you think I should address or questions that have come up here in the chat? I haven't been watching. Yeah, thanks, Dan. We have a few questions we can get started with and uh, see where it takes us. Uh, one question is on your thoughts on vermicompost as an inoculant. Um, vermicompost as an inoculant, uh, sure. Or if you're making your own potting soil, just as an ingredient in your potting soil would functionally accomplish that objective. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, as I mean, compost is a is a much broader conversation. There's great compost, and there's stuff that you really shouldn't be using. Um, vermicompost usually, the if the worms are are able to function, what there comes out their rear end is in pretty good shape. Um, so you can, um, you know, create a dynamic with worm tea where it can go anaerobic, and you can mess it up a little bit. But in general, good stuff. Okay, and uh, this question. Uh, you touched on, but I'll just leave uh, an opportunity if there's anything you want to add. But the question is, uh, would seaweed and kelp be a good source for minerals? Ooh, um, I don't think so. I think that, I mean, would they be a good source? Yes, but at the level that we would need to address mineral deficiencies, we would basically need to be harvesting a lot of the kelp out of the ocean, which is already, there's not enough of. It's a very powerful um, carbon sequester. It's a wonderful... Um, ecosystem, um, you know, for the, for, for the fish and the baby fish and the whole, the whole system to function well. So I don't really advocate the use of kelp that much. Um, if we can understand that just because of that, it's, it is a, a resource, which is relatively limited, um, a, and oftentimes it's something you have to purchase, which I'm generally philosophically opposed to, uh, as a farmer, if I can find a local source of something just as good, I'd rather use that. Uh, think about the, the kelp as a, a viney rapidly growing plant it's full of these growth hormones as part of why it's so wonderful um i mean it, i'll just say if you are living close to the ocean and the storm comes through and there's kelp laying on the laying on the beach i would say that's great but buying it in bottles at, in large quantities i wouldn't recommend but the point is as a viney plant rapidly growing um it is think of think of uh, you know down south you've got kudzu um, I'm not sure up, up here, we've got uh, Jap Japanese knotweed, we've got um, bittersweet. There are some what are called invasive plants, which are actually wonderful mineral bioaccumulators that also, you know, are, you know, sometimes people consider them to be a problem um, that are, are also full of those growth hormones and are really quite, quite vibrant, vital things. So if you can harvest those from your environment and make teas out of them, um, you know, quite, quite uh, beneficial things will occur. So, um, yeah. Okay, and here's a question. Um, do you rely on frequent soil tests to evaluate mineral balancing or are you looking more at the plant needs for amendments? Um, as I said, initial soil tests I think are valuable and once you've addressed things broadly, then it would be the plant that you would be referring to for guidance, yeah. Um, Okay, and I saw Linda Coffey, one of our livestock specialists, Atra, um, had a question about mineralization and it being 
too toxic. Um, she refers to that as could happen with livestock. Is that the same with plants? Um, well, certainly some of these uh, soluble salts like, you know, boron or, um, you know, copper can be applied at quantities that are too high. Um, generally, if you've got a reasonable agronomist, um, they wouldn't be recommending those kinds of concentrations. I do generally recommend that if you are going to be using those soluble salt um, trace element you know, concentrates, that you buffer them with some sort of an organic molecule, a, a humic material or a biochar. Um, worm castings are great actually for that. Um, and if you're going to be using things like rock dust, uh, because it's not soluble to begin with, um, you would never have a problem um, like that. It basically rock dust is the foundation of what your soil is made from. Um, and so it's just there in, you know, small particle size, broad mineral spectrum for the microbes to, you know, solubilize and, and digest as they need. So it's basically like a reserve account, um, but non-soluble. Thank you. And here's a question uh, from Devana, sort of looking at the French intensive system. Um, she's wondering about your perspective on using horse manure for fertility. Um, you know, I'm generally okay with people using manure. I don't use manure. I don't use compost. I don't use, I don't use nitrogen. Uh, that's one of my, I've got a few rules on my farm. One is never kill an insect. One is never kill a disease. And the third one is never add nitrogen. Um, you know, I consider that, you know, th was it 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen of all the trees in the forest, you know, most of whom are not legumes. Nobody's generally adding nitrogen fertilizer there. We have, you know, plenty of, of nitrogen fixing microbes that have symbiotic relationships with every single family of crop plants. We've known this since the seventies. Um, you should not need to add nitrogen if your system is functioning well. Um, in some cases, the nitrogenase enzyme, well, the nitrogenase enzyme, which is used by those microbes to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, has one element of cobalt at the center of it. So if you don't have sufficient cobalt levels, then your nitrogen fixation process may be, um, oh, sorry, that's molybdenum. Um, nit nitrogenase enzyme is molybdenum. Um, so if you don't have sufficient molybdenum levels, then that nitrogen fixation process on your farm may not work, but that can be addressed through you know, a couple actual pounds of molybdenum per acre. It's not a large, large, large amendment. Um, so um, I also consider that, you know, a healthy soil has high levels of, of uh, earthworms in it. I think it's something like uh, 15 earthworms per square yard equals, uh, I think it's 40,000 pounds of earthworm castings per acre per year. So um, I would say I'm getting 20 tons of amazing animal manure Comp, you know, deposited on my soil through the year by the by the animals that are there. Um, so certainly you can you can bring in those kinds of materials. Uh, sometimes what the horses are fed or the bedding that the horses are using has you know heavy duty um, toxins in it. So you want to be careful about that. Um, in general, my suggestion is, you know, the more you're working with nature, the less you need to be bringing in. And Dan, that's sort of bringing in some more questions regarding the use of animal manures and or as compost. Um, so yeah. there's a couple of questions sort of relating more towards, do you have a preference of one type of animal manure as more desirable than, than others? Um, again, I don't use animal manures or compost um, as a general, you know, I, I don't find it necessary. Um, I think, um, you know, ideally, you know, if you do have animals on your property, uh, you know, you can run them through the fields in the wintertime, um, you know, run chicken tractors through, run the, run the cows through uh, to graze down the cover crops. Um, but I would say earthworm manure is my favorite animal manure. All right, and uh, I'm just gonna sort of jump out of line here and relate to a conversation I've had with you over the past several years. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk more about, um, you just mentioned the idea of keeping diseases and pests um, in present within, within your operation. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that in terms of crop rotations? Uh, crop rotation, sure. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, uh, I've got a couple things to say about crop rotation. For starters, you know, if, the, if, the, if the guiding thesis is um, mimic nature, 
And you know, the one of the principles behind crop rotation is you have all carrots here this year and all cucumbers there next year and all tomatoes there the next year. Um, it's you're presuming a monoculture model, which you know is an, an actual system situation in a lot of our, our market market farms. Um, and so that is by itself a violation of nature because uh, nature doesn't do monocultures, she does polycultures. So uh, just taking that into consideration, um, when you do your cover crops, hopefully you're doing cover crops every year or, or most years um, at the end of the season around the edges, um, that is an opportunity to uh, establish a polyculture. And as you know, a chicken has a different gut flora from a rabbit, which has a different gut flora from a cow, um, a, a daikon radish has a different gut flora than a um, a cucumber does than a tomato does. And so the broader the spectrum of species and families of plants you've got growing in a, in a region, in a, you know, in a reasonable amount of space, the broader the spectrum of microbes. So you really do want to, as much as possible, have that, that breadth of, of different families of plants, which you can accomplish through cover crops. Um, so presuming you are doing cover crops, you know, and you are maintaining that, that good level of biological activity, um, what I like to say is, would it make sense as a farmer for you to give um, colostrum from a, a rabbit to a calf? Um, you know, I think a lot of people would say, no, it doesn't make sense. So I would say if you had leeks growing there last year, which had, you know, created a spectrum of microbiology that would be appropriate for the allium family of plants, then why would you put the brassicas in there next year? Right. If you if you if the objective is to have that good gut flora, that appropriate tuned microbiology, um, I would suggest that it may be beneficial to put tomatoes in the same hoop house year after year. Um, and um, you know, sometimes those volunteer tomatoes that grow where the tomatoes were last year do much more well than the ones that you started inside and transplanted out into the other other fields. So, um, in general, I say. Um, and then the other final point is. Uh, you know, do the oaks rotate themselves? Um, you know, you don't see plants necessarily in nature rotating themselves per se. Um, they establish an, an environment and they're able to manage their environment for their health. I think the assumptions behind rotation are that the act of growing food wears the soil out. The act of growing food, you know, builds toxins, builds pathogens, etc. cetera. Um, not, not toxins, but pathogens. Um, and there's no way to address those pathogens without moving the plants around. Um, so I would say not my ex experience. My experience growing up on an organic farm was we, we rotated our potatoes and every year the potato bugs ate the potatoes. We rotated the you know cucumbers and every year the powdery mildew ate the cucumbers. We rotated the, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think rotation solves the underlying health issue. Um, but that may be the point you were hoping me to get to. No, that was great, thank you. And here could be a, a loaded question um, regarding your thoughts on the use of biochar. Uh, biochar. Um, well, you know, I think if you look down in the Amazon where it was, you know, first popularized from the archaeological record, um, um, the, you know, the, the human cultural record, it was a very powerful tool for building soil. And, you know, 500 years later, after the, you know, the communities that were there uh, were exterminated, uh, still the area where they had biochar is rich, dark earth. Um, so as far as a systemic strategy for building soil in otherwise weak soil areas, I think there's a, a lot to, it has a lot to offer. Um, it, you know, it was done in situ from materials grown there. And I think that's a key piece of this puzzle. If you're going to be talking about cutting down all the trees to make biochar to put on the fields so we can have more soil carbon, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but perhaps coming through and taking your corn stover and turning it into biochar and putting it right back onto the field. Now that's, that's a, an idea that has a lot of, a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I don't think we've had the, the efficient cost effective systems, um, really popularized yet. Um, if you do make biochar, you know, it's, it's, you know, the, the general recommendation is to put it into your compost pile when you're building your compost pile and it'll be amazing uh, in its effect when you spread that compost. But raw biochar stripped on, on the field can have some, you know, at least short-term negative effects. Uh, so 
I'm I'm bullish on it as a as a concept if it's done well. But you know, people trying to sell farmers, you know, big tractor trailer loads of biochar at prices that are not plausible or realistic, I, I, that that's not going to work. Yeah, thank you. And um, and just thinking about this too, I'm wondering, based on your experience with your parents' farm and your farm and farms you work with, can you talk a little bit about some of the tools you use or you see most uh, effective in in sort of the, the planting process, uh, sort of at the at the market farm scale, uh, like like actual infrastructure machinery kind of stuff or, or concepts or um, hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people do things differently. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, the water wheel it seems like it's a classic a classic uh, instrument out there that's used by a lot of people. I I found the. Um, uh, what are those little trays that sort of pull out um, of the paper pot transplanter? Paper pot transplanter. A lot of people. A lot of people on a you know on a smaller scale than a than a um, than a, a, a water wheel transplanter are using those to some you know effect. Uh, those are really exciting. I see people do you know actually carrots like that. Um, if I think the paper pot themselves are too expensive, but it's a brilliant idea. Um, and the more we understand about uh, things like um, um, SRI, system of rice intensification, um, plant uh, age at time of transplant, um, the more we understand we really should be putting our seedlings in at more like 10 or 12 or 14 days old as opposed to two or four or six or eight weeks old. And so I think the paper pot transplanters are a technique which can really be helpful in that process. Um, although sometimes, yeah, so those are quick couple points. Sure, and it is my understanding that the paper pot transplanter is still not allowed in organics, uh, oh, certified really? organic, uh, due to the okay. glue within the paper, I but I, I know it's up for debate yeah. still. Uh, here's a question from Darren, and he's wondering, how do you know how to make sure not to add too much sea salt? Um, you would, uh, through a, a base saturation test, you would you know look for your sodium levels, uh, if ideally between one and 3%, so over 3% would be a, would be a, um, a point where you would stop. If you're do if you're in an area where it rains twenty or thirty or more inches a a year, seventy five pounds per acre of sea salt is a is a you know is a safe dose, um, just because it'll get slowly leached out. The other thing to look for is soil conductivity, um, and I would say if you're above eight hundred on conductivity, that would probably be a reason to not add salt. Um, usually, that's only an issue in hoop houses or in areas where they get a very um, uh, low low rain levels. All right, and Dan, we have about one minute left. Didn't know if there's any uh, final thoughts you want to share before we wrap it up. Uh, this has been great, quick. You know, uh, <laughs> trying to cover a lot in 45 minutes, but I got good questions. And um, yeah, people, if they're interested in our work with nutrient density, um, the bionutrient meter, things like that, we have uh, you know bionutrient.org. You said at the beginning, and um, realfoodcampaign.org, and we do have our conference ongoing. Um, thank you, NCAT, for sponsoring very much. Um, uh, it's every Thursday, as you said, at 3 p.m. Eastern for eight months. So um, sort of a, a, a weekly, weekly webinar uh, series, which is great fun. So that's uh, soilandnutrition.org. But good luck to everyone. All right. On that note, I want to thank you all so much for, for joining in on this session. And a reminder that the surveys are available on the Huvu app on the left-hand side. Dan, as always, it's wonderful to see you and great. I learned something every time I, I hear from you and uh, really appreciate your time today. Pleasure as always. As pleasure Thank you as always, so Dan. much. Good talking. Yeah.